do you think women in the sciences can do to professionalize themselves? I think this is really an important issue and one that we've worked uh, with women scientists around the world on. And the reason is because women oftentimes are act in their countries or their regions in ways that are culturally acceptable and oftentimes that means that they speak very softly and uh, may not make eye contact because that's culturally the way they're used to interacting with people. But as professionals, including women scientists, you must work on an international level, which means that you need to be working with scientists and interacting with scientists in Germany and the United States and other European countries where the norm is to be able to speak clearly, look someone in the eye, and say what your uh, belief is on either your research or the educational endeavors that you're having. And so I think it's really important for uh, many women in this region to come out of their comfort zone in order to be ready to interact in an international setting because otherwise they will be dismissed as not important by those that are not used to the culture. So in our coach program, we do workshops which train women to be more assertive and then get them practice how they can be more assertive when they're in an international setting, which includes shaking hands, strong eye contact, and making sure that they're connecting on a professional level, which may be a different level than if they were with their friends in their countries. How do you think men can serve as allies? Well, I think men play an incredibly important role. Science is a big network, and if you really want your science to be known and recognized, you need to be in that network. And research shows that men are more likely to be in that network, and they need to help other women get into that network because women often don't have those ties that allow them to get into those networks. And that's why men can be very important in mentoring and networking women so that they can be active players in the scientific uh, realm also. And that's particularly important at the uh, level at which one is starting to advance their career. So it's nice to introduce your students, uh, the men to introduce their students to colleagues, but it's equally important for the senior women to be introduced. Can you share some more specific examples of maybe conferences, notable journals, professional organizations, or other networking opportunities that might be relevant to women in the lower Mekong region? Well, we uh, coach the organization that I, I run is really unique in the programs that it gives. And in particular, what we have done around the world, and it's uh, somewhat new to this region, is that we conduct workshops which bring together women scientists from the United States, together with women scientists in a region around a scientific topic that is important in that region. Such as in Latin America, we've had a project on natural disasters, earthquakes and tsunamis and heavy flooding, uh, in which we brought women together around that focus to help build a network. And part of that two to three day workshop for about 25 women is to really talk about how you can advance each other's careers, but also help people in your communities with the research that you're doing. And in this case, it's primarily risk assessment and and the geosciences. And so that's one way that we have uh, helped in a region on a topic that's particularly interesting. And then in, the, uh, in Africa, the topic is water, around a, a meeting we have in Namibia that's coming up. With regards to career development, this specifically focuses on these issues of better communication, better how to publish, how to write grant proposals, how to network, how to mentor others, how to negotiate for what you need. All of those topics are workshops that we provide in country. And we've done those in, when asked, and we can come up with uh, resources. And we've run those in 10 different countries in Africa and a number in Latin America. And we actually ran one here in Thailand uh, last January, which was sponsored by L'Oreal and held at MTech. And we had over 100 uh, women there, and that was very exciting, and we taught leadership skills and communication skills and negotiation. So that's one of the reasons that we're back now is to talk about if there's any interest in pursuing that further in the uh, Lower Mekong region. From your decorated bio, 
that you are an excellent role model for all women, and especially women in science. But I wonder, who are some of your role models? Well, um, I have to admit, my big role model was my mother. And I didn't have any female professors all the way through undergraduate school or graduate school. So there were really no women that were role models to me in the science. Uh, my, I did have men that helped mentor. But uh, my mother, who was uh, not a scientist, she was a beautician. Um, but she was very intent on making certain that her daughters had careers that could um, earn them a living. And so she pushed us all to take a lot of math. Because in her mind, I grew up on a farm in the middle of the United States. And in her mind, if you were good at math, you could do anything. So when I went to college, I had no idea what engineering was. I thought this was someone that drove a train. And I didn't have any sense of what an engineer was until I got to college and then realized that there was physics and chemistry and, and my math, which she pushed so hard to get us to do, that my math actually was the foundation for all of those disciplines. So if there's any advice I give to young women today, it's to uh, be good at your math skills because they will carry you a long way and allow you to do things that you may not be able to imagine when you're at a young age. Well, um, you just mentioned that a uh, you know, strong foundation in math can, can lead to so many possibilities uh, for young, young girls, young people. Um, but I wonder, is there anything more, what, or what else can we do to encourage young girls to get involved in the STEM fields? I think supportive teachers are critically important. And in, I know that in countries in this region and in many other parts of the world, we need to continue those efforts to encourage young girls to go into STEM fields. Because I tell you, there's nothing more exciting than doing science. I mean, I just I could talk at en endlessly uh, on that. And to have students that you teach in science, there's just nothing better. But I think it's really important uh, for us to not lose track of the fact that as we are also trying to get a lot of girls into the system, that they need role models. And I do know in this region that the number of women that are in leadership positions in science, and that means leaders, leaders in research, leaders in academic institutions, that the percentage is quite low. And so it's really important that we not only work to get more girls into the system, but we also make, make certain that women are moving up the ladder so they can be more effective role models for the younger, for the younger girls. And I'm not an expert uh, in this area, in this region, with regards to those issues, but certainly in what I've observed so far, it is women that are trying to reach the higher levels uh, are challenged. Do you know of any other particular challenges that women scientists might face in the lower Mekong region besides rising through the ranks? My guess, is, my guess is it's not so dissimilar from a lot of the other countries that we've worked in, and it's really the challenge of the work-life balance. So once you achieve uh, your scientific background and your expertise in science, uh, then you start thinking, Gee, it might be nice to have a family. <laughs> you know, it might be, and, and there is pressure, uh, uh, different degrees of pressure in different countries as to when to have those children. Um, and what we find in many countries is, uh, particularly in uh, the countries that scientists I've interacted with in this country as well as in the Middle East and Africa, is the challenge is how to be able to manage home life and taking care of the house and the children while also being able to keep the career going. And uh, if I were to um, contrast that with the United States, the United States, the challenges are identical. But men are more likely to help with the household duties. So uh, it's very interesting. We had just written a paper on the North African countries uh, where we studied women's challenges there and contrasted it with the women participants. And the women there said that they had 
no difficulty with men accepting them as being equal uh, scientists, equal qualifications. They were more than happy to help them advance in their careers. But the women just didn't have the time for science because they were spending so much time cooking and keeping the house and, the, and in India, the mother-in-law issue and all of those issues was a uh, very different challenge than the U.S., even though the women in the U.S. were saying, oh my gosh, I just wish all the men would think I was as smart as all the other men. So it's really interesting how the different challenges are, are culturally specific, and so that's why I'm interested in learning more about uh, the countries in the Lower Mekong region to find out how, uh, how, what those challenges are. And with COACH, we generally bring a social scientist with us to study those issues to help us inform our programs for the future. Do you know of any particular resources or assets then that, that women tend to bring to the sciences? Well, I think one of the most interesting workshops that we run uh, through these programs is negotiation and how women can learn to negotiate for what they need. And the reason I say that is because that's when a lot of these cultural issues arise. And it comes down to many of the women are afraid to ask for things that they need. And it's important for women to get over that and to learn how to negotiate for what they need. Because many of the men feel comfortable asking for things. But in India, we hear that the women are uncomfortable because they're afraid it's like begging and they don't want to beg. And so there's issues of you know, how can women be more successful in the workplace. It's certainly do the best science, absolutely do the best science. But then keep in mind that there are other things that are going on in any workplace. Whereas if you're not attentive to some of the, uh, these issues of career advancement, and admit that you want to advance in your careers, that it's not a selfish thing to want to advance in your career, that that's what you really uh, need to think about also. I'm wondering what changes have you seen over the past 10 years in the issues facing, facing women scientists? I can mostly reflect on the United States. And in that case, I think there's more of a recognition by the men that this is an important issue, that we are wasting talent if we don't provide the opportunities for women scientists to succeed. And we cannot afford to waste talent. To put all of this education into both men and women, but then not offer the opportunity for women to be really creative. And I think that there's more recognition in the United States how important that is. And I'm increasingly seeing that in many of the emerging countries also, that they are recognizing that they can't afford to not pay attention to allowing their women scientists to be creative instead of being overburdened. And I think that makes me feel really positive about the way things are going. Do you foresee any changes in the next 10 years beyond maybe you know, even more increasing recognition by men? I think with the recognition, uh, hand in hand with the recognition that men are having about this issue, is that the governments are also. And, there, and many of the countries that we work in, uh, in the Middle East and Africa, they realize that energy problems and water problems are really challenging, and they don't have a deep enough p talent pool to answer them unless they make sure the full scientific enterprise, both men and women, are fully engaged. And so at the highest levels of government, I'm seeing that spoken in a, more emphatically than I had heard before, which was just to be nice, um, but really a desperate need. And so I think as countries realize that they need as much scientific power to face the challenges of water, energy, and health, that it will even become more imperative to increase uh, women's participation. So I'm optimistic. Mm, yeah, that's sort of a, a really galvanizing call to action, I think, for all of us. Uh, so we are reaching the end of our time. Do you have any final comments that you'd like to share with us? Well, let me uh, finish with saying I'm very much looking forward to the next few months of visiting the Lower Mekong region. I'm honored to be uh, chosen as the envoy for this region for science and technology. And the more people I can meet and learn about this region will make me very happy. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on these issues.